Picture this. You've been there since the beginning. You did extensive pedigree research to find the perfect match between two dogs. You were there when your pup was born. You raised her from infancy, loving her as your own. You spent years training your dog in agility, obedience, and grooming. And it all leads to this moment. You hold your breath as the judge calls out the winner of one of the most prestigious dog shows. Did you win? Well, someone on Team Dog knows this exact feeling, and she's here to tell us about it. Hello, I'm James Jacobson, and welcome to The Long Leash. The Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show has ended, and one of our Team Dog members was a winner. It's Kate Baysdow. She is the associate producer of Dog Cancer Answers, one of the DPN shows that gives vetted advice for people whose dogs are suffering from cancer. Kate Baysdow, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So you produce one of our shows, Dog Cancer Answers, but you co-own a dog that was a winner at Westminster. Tell us about that. I do. So my breed is the Belgian Traveran. They're a herding breed originally from Belgium. Most people are more familiar with the Belgian Malinois, the short-haired version that does a lot of police and military work. Belgian Traveran are the same basic dog, but long-haired. Very attractive, very athletic, very smart, which can be both a good thing and a bad thing. And so I have two of them that live with me in my house, but I also co-own a couple dogs with my mom and some close friends. And one of the dogs that I co-own and have showed a couple times showed with her primary owner at Westminster and won Best of Breed. So she was chosen as the the best one out of all 22 turves that showed. Her name is Bridget. So Bridget is this dog that you co-own with your mom. And how many Um, many people? Three of us co-own her. I co-own her with my friend Eva, who does sheep herding with her and owns a couple relatives. And all of our dogs are related too. So it's a big family affair. (laughs) And then her primary owner is Karen Cummings. And Karen was the one who showed her. Yep. Okay. So... You were actually supposed to be at Westminster yourself this year. I was. I was supposed to be there showing one of the dogs that I own with my mom. But unfortunately, I came down with COVID the week before and was still in quarantine. So I Mm. did not get to go, which was a bummer. So when you got the news about Bridget, what was that like for you? Oh, gosh. I was watching the live stream on my laptop, and I screamed so loud the cat fell off my desk. (laughs) (laughs) I was screaming and cheering and laughing and crying. Oh, it was wonderful. I had shown my dog, Lina, who is Bridget's aunt, to the judge, Tommy Cohen, who was judging Turves this year. And I knew he liked Lina, and so I was quite sure he would like Bridget. And when we found out that he would be judging Turves at Westminster this year, I had said to Karen, like, oh, we really should get her there. And she had also always wanted to go just as something to cross off her bucket list as a fun experience. Was this her first time? Yeah. She had never shown at Westminster before. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you have. You've, You've done the Westminster thing several times. Yep. I've done it a couple times. My first time at Westminster was 2007 with my dog, Queasel, who was Bridget's grandmother. And she won Best of Opposite that year. So that whoa, meant whoa, whoa, that... Well, well you got to translate <laughs> Best of Opposite. Yeah. So the whole dog show system is a series of tiers where you start with a bunch of dogs and then it gradually narrows down to the one at the top, Best in Show. So within your breed judging, first, the dogs that do not have their championships yet compete against each other to earn points toward their championship. Then all the dogs that are already champions come in together and the judge chooses from those their best of breed. So the best of breed is the best one of that breed in the ring that day. Mm -hmm. If best of breed is a male, then best of opposite or best of opposite sex goes to a female. If best of breed was a female, best of opposite goes to a male. So opposite as an opposite sex. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. And then they also award two select awards, which is to their second pick in both the males and females. And for big shows like Westminster or each breed has a national specialty each year 
and the AKC National Championship, they also do awards of merit, which are based on the number of dogs entered. So if you only have like five dogs entered, they might only have one or even zero awards of merit available. But if you have 40 dogs, a higher number of dogs can get the award of merit. But that's an award that's only offered at big shows. Okay, so let's talk about, when you talk about big shows, from a layperson's perspective, to me, Westminster sounds like the most important show. Is it? It certainly has the most prestige and, well, the longest tradition. The Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show has been happening longer than the AKC has been in existence. So it's really, yeah. (laughs) The first Westminster Kennel Club show was in 1877, and the AKC was formed in 1884. Wow. So, Westminster, Westminster's been around a little while. (laughs) And just the history of the show is so incredible. It really is a show that people enter and go to just for the experience. And if you win, that's icing on the cake. But just being there with all the other amazing dogs, and handlers and dogs that you might only see online or in a magazine all year long, and then they all get together for this show. So it's pretty cool. So paint a picture for us. Obviously, you weren't there this year, but normally, what's it like? I know it's been moved recently because of COVID from Madison Square Garden, but paint a picture of what Westminster has been like when you've been. So I've been lucky that I've been at Westminster in all three locations, My first couple times when I went, the entire show was at Madison Square Garden. So they had judging during the day out on that green carpet Hmm. in the arena floor, and then in the evening would do the televised group judging. That was insane. It was so crowded, so packed. The line for the bathroom was an hour and a half long. (laughs) Thankfully, I had dressed in layers because I needed to change to be ready to show. And I could not have gotten to the bathroom to change in time. So luckily I was able to change right in the middle of the aisle, surrounded by crowds of people without actually stripping and getting arrested. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't know if in Madison Square Garden, you'd even be noticed if you did that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But so then a couple years after that, I'm not sure exactly which year, they started doing the daytime judging out at the piers in Pier 92 and Pier 94. Mm -hmm. That is certainly much easier to get into and has a lot more space. Mm -hmm. So there's more space for the dogs and the people and more space for spectators to enjoy seeing all the dogs, talking to people, looking at vendors, and a little bit more room around the rings that you don't have the benefit of the stadium seating Mm -hmm. there. But then still the group judging at night, which is televised, moved back to the garden for each show for those years. Then last year, because of COVID, they ended up moving the event. Normally, it's in February in New York City. So they moved it to June so that it could be outside on the grounds of the Lindhurst Mansion in Terrytown, New York. It is a stunning venue, absolutely beautiful grounds, breathtaking views of the Hudson. Hard to compete with New York City in cold, <laughs> slushy February. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's, I was thrilled when they announced where it was going to be. I was like, we need to enter a dog, whether or not any of the judges will like them. I need to just support this because it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like I can go to Westminster without getting stuck in a blizzard. That sounds fantastic. So you've been in all three different venues and obviously mm-hmm. being outdoors in New York in the summer sounds a lot nicer. But in terms of the energy and the vibe, and, and you said, I mean, this is on everyone who's in the dog showing business is bucket list. Why is it? Why is Westminster such a big deal? Because of the history, because it's been around so long. And certainly if you win best in show, the prize money is great, but only one dog gets that out of the whole thing. But really the history and the culture of it, like it is the equivalent of the Super Bowl, but for dogs and dog shows. And so the energy is fantastic because all the people are excited and thrilled to be there. And it is kind of fun in normal times. It is what is called a benched show, which means that you are supposed to show up at a certain time in the morning and you and your dog have to stay 
or at least your dog does, the whole day until a designated time at the end of the day. And that is so that spectators can see all of the different breeds and dogs. No matter what time of the day they show up to come and view the show, they can see all of the breeds there. The last couple of years, because of COVID, that has not been the case, and it hasn't been benched because they didn't want to keep everyone stuck together in the same place long term. And how far away do people have to stay away from the benches? Like, how close can they get? Oh, you can get right up and see, look at the dogs in their crates. Can you handle the dog, or can you pet the dog? With permission. Okay. So what a lot of people do is we all usually have our grooming tables to help prepare our dogs anyway. And so when it was all in Madison Square Garden, there wasn't enough room. But once it moved to the piers, you could set up your grooming table right in front of your bench spot Mm -hmm. and have your dog up on the table so that people can see them a little bit better and can pet them and talk to you about them without having the entire crowd looming over your dog. So it's a little more accessible and comfortable. And usually everyone within a breed works together a little bit and tries to rotate which dog is out so that they can all get some breaks during the day and have a nap time and take turns that way. So you you mentioned earlier the fact that you have to change your clothes for the presentation and you're wearing layers. We've all seen on television the the very elegant attire that most people are walking around the ring with. What's the story behind that? Again, a nod to tradition. The idea is to dress nicely as a show of respect for the judge and for your breed and your dog. When you're standing at the bench, when people are coming by, how does one dress there? And is that the same? That's totally personal preference. I am very comfortable in my skirt suits. I love them. So I'll often still be dressed in my show clothes for a good chunk of the day. But once I know I'm done showing, often I'll change out because the risk of spilling something on dry clean only clothes is not the most fun. (laughs) So I'll change back to more casual clothes for hanging out. Usually a breed themed t-shirt. Gotta, gotta represent. (laughs) Does uh, a lot of thought generally go into what the people are wearing? Oh yeah. Especially for an event like Westminster, that's when a lot of us bring our sparkles. If we've got something with sparkles on it, and especially if you're hoping to show in the group, Most people have a backup outfit, a special one planned just for the group judging. Because if you're going to be on TV, it needs to be a color that's going to look good. Because it's not quite as bad as it used to be. It used to be that you really did not want to wear red on TV because it just looked awful. But people also plan the color that they wear based on their dog's color. So you don't want your dog to blend in with your clothing. If you have a black dog and you wear black (laughs) and stand behind your dog, the judge loses some of the outline in it. So you want a color that contrasts with the dog, but also complements. And pockets are sacred in dog show wardrobes. Because? Got to have room for treats and brushes and any number of extra things to bring along. And you have to be able to kind of uh, trot generally. I mean, you don't wear clothes that are uncomfortable to trot in. Yes, especially if you have a long-legged dog. You need to be able to run to keep up with your dog at a trotting pace. With that, we're going to take a quick break here. But when we come back, Kate, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your own experience at Westminster. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpuff. The green, grassy, beef liver spike smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpuff traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. It helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want my Everpup. It just makes me feel good. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the Everpup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. 
But to get the best price possible, join the EverPup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. We are back. So other than Westminster, how many shows have you participated in in your life? In my life? Oh, gosh. Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds. Okay. So what does a typical, like over the course of a year, how many shows might you visit? So since becoming an adult and having to work and all that fun stuff, I usually keep it to around 14 weekends a year. And for me, I as well as doing confirmation shows like Westminster, I also compete in a variety of performance events. So obedience, agility, tracking, which is like search and rescue. Once in a while, I dip my toes into the herding arena, working sheep or ducks, things like that. So I have to kind of base around what I can get to, what's close, and what sports my dogs are ready for at a given time. And so that's about a quarter of the year, like one event a month that you're off to. And mm-hmm. these events are not just local. I mean, you travel a distance sometimes. Yep. Particularly for my national specialty show each year. And each breed has a national specialty event each year where the breed club sponsors a show that is just dogs of that breed. So like the German Shepherd National is just German Shepherds. The Labrador Retriever National is just labs. And depending on the size of the club and what the members of the club are interested in, that show can be up to a week long with different events going on just for that breed. So this year, my mom and I drove from New York all the way out to Oregon for our national specialty. And we stayed the whole week competing in a variety of different sports with our turfs. And how did you do? We did all right. My dog, Lina, did very well in agility. She qualified in all of her classes and won first place in all of her classes. And then in rally, she qualified in all of her classes again. And my six-month-old puppy, Bruni, went in the rally ring for the very first time and was super cute and did very well was ended up fifth place in her class. She was just out of the ribbons, but had the next highest score. And in the sweepstakes division, which was confirmation, Lina got best of opposite in the veterans division. And in the regular judging, we didn't do super well, but we had a good time. So you come by this passion naturally. Your mom is a veterinarian. Correct. And you were raised sort of in this show arena, I imagine, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. How old were you when you went to your first show? Oh, an infant. I was carted around to shows from the get-go. As a toddler, I retrieved a dumbbell tossed by my mom in an obedience training class in my (laughs) mouth. (laughs) Much to her dog's dismay. (laughs) I was going to say that probably confused a lot of folks. Is what we see on television is something that, you know, someone who's not really a show person sees at a spectacle like Westminster. Is that a pretty accurate depiction of what goes on behind the scenes? What you see on television is just the tip of the iceberg. Because that lets you see a little bit of the grooming and prep time that goes into it. But getting ready for a show, even a regular local show, let alone something big like Westminster, is not a one or two day thing. Having a dog is a life commitment. Mm -hmm. And especially getting a dog ready for showing what you see on television in that ring represents years of training and conditioning, grooming, getting the dog ready, socializing the dog, especially for an event like Westminster, where if they're in the group judging, they're going to be exposed to these giant weird cameras moving around, flashing lights, loud noises. The dogs need to be able to handle that. And certainly some dogs you would never want to enter at Westminster because that would be an extremely stressful experience for them. And then it goes even further back than that, because in order to get that puppy in the first place that you then train and prepare to show, you have all the work that the breeder put in 
with the dog's parents and researching pedigrees and doing health testing to produce the healthiest puppy that they possibly could. And it keeps going back and back and back. So yeah, what you see on TV at the show is just a little bit and doesn't even start to all the chasing a naughty dog through the mud and picking up poop and (laughs) late night walks in the rain. (laughs) Is the movie best in show at all accurate? Oh, it's a, that movie is an absolute delight, but I will give the caveat, dog show people either love it or hate it. Oh. If they hate it, usually it's because they are one of the people in the movie. <laughs> so you love it, which <laughs> implies that you're not one of those characters. At least not super accurately. I won't tell you who I'm closest to. <laughs> oh, no, come on. Do tell us. Who are you closest to? <laughs> nope. Some secrets just need to be kept. Okay. Okay. We are, I honor that. So... How do you view yourself? Do you view yourself as a dog show person? Is that sort of the category that you describe? Or how how do you describe yourself? I certainly am a dog show enthusiast. I mean, from, gosh, middle school, when they would always have the, like, describe yourself in three words on the first day of classes, mine was always, I show dogs. And so that's that's me. (laughs) What are some common things that you, I mean, there are, so many different types of people who participate at these dog shows. And, you know, obviously we can assume that, well, they all love dogs, but are there some quirky things that show people are like and that generally have in common? Um, my husband certainly says that we're all crazy. And ah, okay. I well, think we you. are. <laughs> most, How in so? an, most in a benign way, but some... So it does take a certain type of person to dedicate a large chunk of your life to carting a dog around to shows and then doing something with them in public, hoping that they behave and do things well, especially sports like obedience. My second dog was an Australian shepherd, and she taught me a lot about humility, which was an excellent lesson for a teenager to get. But because I never knew which dog I had until the first step of the healing pattern. Did I have the dog that I had had since she was a puppy and been taking to class weekly to practice? Or did I have a dog that had never been off the farm and certainly never been taught to sit? And one of those days when she just wandered around the ring looking lost, the judge looked at me and said, if I didn't know you, I would think this was not your dog. And that's where the humility came in? Yep. And that was just Tia because... Some days she felt like playing, some days she didn't. When she did, she was a really great sport dog, and we had a lot of fun together. But some days she just wasn't in the mood, and I had to learn to roll with that and say, you know what, that's okay. We will try again tomorrow. Because at the end of the day, win or lose, she's still my dog. What other lessons have showing dogs given you? Uh, Definitely a lot with sportsmanship. And working with and interacting with a wide range of people from a very young age, going to shows with my mom, I was seeing people from all over the United States and internationally, all different races and ethnicities. Dogs bring people together from all different walks of life. You get people who have a private jet and fly their dogs all over the country. And then you have people who can only make it to shows an hour away from home and are bringing three kids along as well. So other than the the, the craziness, to use your <laughs> husband's term, what is it that drives people to do it, whether they're flying in on their jet or taking their car down the freeway? A very strong passion for people really dedicated and involved in a particular breed in confirmation. Usually it's a very strong passion about their breed. And again, confirmation, define that. Confirmation with an O, not with an I. So you're not getting confirmed in the Catholic Church, (laughs) but confirmation as in structure. That's the word for competitions like Westminster, where you're evaluating the dog on their structure and what's called breed type which means how much they look like the ideal blueprint of that breed. Which is dictated or constantly being adapted, but is, it comes from AKC in America. It doesn't come from AKC. So AKC is kind of a club of clubs. Mm-hmm. So each breed club, when a breed is recognized by AKC, each breed gets a parent club or a national club, which is made up of enthusiasts of that breed 
and they get together and come up with a standard, a written blueprint of what their breed should look like. Obviously, some things are objective, like color. Some things are more subjective. And different breeds focus on different things. For example, my breed has a disqualification for height. Dogs can be either too short or too tall. A lot of breeds do not have that. They just give a recommended range. Some of the toy breeds actually have a weight disqualification. So if a dog is too heavy and too big, they can be disqualified. And then anything from coat, color, number of teeth, how the teeth line up in the mouth. And some of those things included in the breed standard are mostly aesthetic, but a lot of the other points are based on the function that that breed originally needed to perform. So for my breed, the Belgian Tavern, structure and angulation of the front and hind limbs is very important because they're a breed that needs to be able to be working on the farm all day and to hold up physically and be able to keep up. Is temperament ever one of the things that is objectively looked at? Oh, absolutely. Temperament is a hard thing for most people to say could be evaluated objectively. And in confirmation shows, the judge needs to be able to get their hands on and do a physical exam of that dog. And that's how they determine the temperament. Yes. Yep. The dog should be confident. They don't have to. A golden retriever, they all might throw themselves at you wanting to be petted. (laughs) My breed is more reserved. They're often not dogs that want to gush over every person. And that's fine. But they should still stand confident and let the judge do what they need to do. So low lights and highlights. What, what's the lowest? What's the thing that you have personally experienced when you were showing dog? One bad one was my dog, Queasel, who was a very successful dog in a variety of events. She was a show dog at heart. Hmm. She was born to be a show dog. She knew she was amazing, and she was. It was a privilege and an honor to be the person on the other end of her leash. And one weekend, we had a great slate of judges that I knew would like her a lot. And she stepped on a bee outside the ring and got stung on her foot and was lame. Mm. And lameness is a disqualification because these dogs should be sound and moving freely and naturally. So she was not able to show that weekend, which was very sad. Such things happen. And then a highlight, I would imagine it would be finding out that one of the dogs you've come. Bridget winning at Westminster absolutely was a highlight. Yeah. My highest highlight was when my dog Lina and I won best of breed at our national specialty show in 2015. Ah, okay. That was spectacular. Having my first bred by puppy that I had researched the pedigrees, chosen the stud dog. I was there when she was born. I picked to keep her, and she won best of breed at our national specialty and was ranked number one in our breed for several months. That was my highest high. But winning the breed at Westminster has always been on my bucket list as well. And Bridget gets me a step closer on that. As long as I can remember, the announcer for the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show has been Mike Lefebvre, who was the announcer this year as well. And I have always wanted to hear him say Belgian Tavern number whatever, and it be me with my turf. And so this year I got to be like, that's, that's Bridget. Like I picked her out. I showed her when she was a baby and it was very cool. So Bridget sounds like a really special dog, but what is special about Bridget from your perspective? Well, for starters, she's gorgeous. She has a nice square silhouette with a beautiful refined head, which is exactly what a Belgian Tavern should be. She's also a lovely mover. She just floats across the grass and around. And also one of the kind of special and unique things is that as well as doing confirmation shows, the like beauty pageant stuff, she also does a lot of different performance work, primarily with Karen. Performance meaning? So performance encompasses pretty much everything except confirmation, all the more talent-based and skill and training-based competitions as opposed to confirmation. 
So Bridget has several rally obedience titles, and she also has several herding titles, working both sheep and ducks. So doing what she was bred to do. She actually just finished her started level duck title in May this year. So we were very excited to be able to have that up on the big screen when she was on TV. And um, she also has done a lot of barn hunt. So recreationally hunting rats in tubes. No rats are actually harmed. They're always in the secure tube, but the dogs have to sniff them out in formations of hay bales and find them and indicate them for you. And she's also done a little bit of dock diving, so jumping into the water. She's not a super fan of dock diving, but she's willing. <laughs> she said like a proud mama. Yeah, she's a fun girl. That's awesome. That is actually a good place for us to end our conversation. Kate Bays now, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, that is all we have time for on today's show. I want to thank you so much for joining us and letting us accompany you on your walk or wherever you're listening to this podcast. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our show. You can do that at our website, longleashshow.com. And of course, you can get it in your favorite podcast catcher. Please, if you enjoyed the program, tell a friend about Dog Podcast Network and this show. And please check out our other shows. You can do that and learn more about all of them on our website for the network at dogpodcastnetwork.com. If you have a suggestion for someone who may be a perfect fit for the long leash, please let us know. Again, reach out to us through one of our websites, either longleashshow.com or dogpodcastnetwork.com. I want to thank you again for listening. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. <laughs>